perhaps to start us off a couple words about your academic background in general, or I guess perhaps your, if not your academic background, your current yeah. work or your recent work. Right. Okay. So I am a uh, professor at the University Hospital in Basel and at the University of Basel. And by set of the Division of Clinical Pharmacology, mm -hmm. and we are doing uh, clinical as well as lab research uh, using psychedelic substances. What brought you in particular to psychedelics research? I know it's a bit of a weird question. Um, yeah, so why do we do uh, psychedelic research? Um, exactly. We have been interested in uh, psychoactive substances for many years, so mm -hmm. maybe already 20 years myself. Uh, and we started research on MDMA, later on stimulants, um, including substances that may enhance the performance, such as uh, methylphenidate or modafinil. Mm -hmm. And then maybe 10 years ago, uh, we got more interested in exploring the effects of substances that have um, even more interesting subjective effect properties than simple stimulants. So the goal was not so much to study uh, whether we can concentrate a little bit longer or something, but rather mm -hmm. to investigate the, the more exceptional states that can be induced by uh, psychedelics. So already with MDMA, we were a little bit in this field. It's, it's a substance that has very strong mood effects. Mm -hmm. But um, of course, uh, psychedelics are even um, more overwhelming and, and unique in their effects. And uh, a first study that was conducted uh, now almost 10 years ago uh, was in the uh, on the effects of LSD in healthy subjects and then uh, later we we also explored the effects of other psychedelics uh, also psilocybin that is more commonly uh, tested or investigated also in patients um, we started a study with mescaline mm -hmm. started to compare the different substances and also initiated the uh, trials in patients that are then explicitly testing like therapeutic effects uh, of these substances. The initial studies were more descriptive, not yet with a therapeutic goal, rather mm -hmm. describing the effects of psychedelics. Although, of course, these type of studies in healthy subjects will also inform us on, on uh, how to use the substances later on in patients. And then only uh, a few years ago, uh, patients were also included in these trials. And now you could say it's more uh, exploring the therapeutic use of these substances, such uh, it's it's similar to uh, developing a medication, you could say, but using substances that have been around for a while. Very very cool. Thank you. Um, I, I'm curious. Uh, was that your main motivation when you transferred over? I think you mentioned it was about ten years ago when you made a switch from more of the simple amphetamines or stimulants towards things with more, I, I think, complex or interesting. Uh, subjective effects was it because of therapy that you maybe you personally or your research group was it because of the therapeutic applications that you thought these were, this was a good direction to go in or was there another or was it in a, had you exhausted perhaps the research on stimulants at the time or was there an original trick i'm just curious like yeah like, looking back oh so the question why why switching from amphetamines or mdma yeah. to to lsd or psilocybin um let's say when the first study was done in humans with MDMA, which was in um, the first placebo-controlled study, which was in Zurich by the Follenweiter lab in the 1990s already, mm -hmm. and it was kind of so it was kind of tricky to do such a study with even with MDMA, mm -hmm. um, because at the time these substances were seen as dangerous drugs essentially, and the therapeutic potential was not recognized certainly not by the, the regulators at this time. Of course, we had in the past the therapeutic use of these substances, but even now, 10 or 20 years ago, this, the, the substances were typically perceived as dangerous, harming our kids and so on. Yeah. So when the, the new, let's say the, the newer wave of, of the psychedelic research started mm -hmm. again uh, this uh, century, um, obviously, researchers initially did not seek to test therapeutic effects. This would not yeah. have been possible. So we started with essentially arguing that these substances need to be described because our kids are taking them. So we need to know whether they are dangerous or not. <laughs> and um, so that, how, that is how it started. And 
I, I would say I did 10 years of, of MDMA research and followed wider in Zurich, did a lot of psilocybin research. And the reason there was essentially the same psilocybin at the time was not well known. Mm-hmm. Um, it would have been difficult to start a study with LSD, especially if you were looking for therapeutic effects and uh, not yeah. possible proper potential. Yeah, a certain stigma. Yeah, exactly. And with yeah. psilocybin, researchers used psilocybin not because it's shorter acting than LSD or anything better or something. It was essentially because they were simply afraid of testing a substance that had so much stigma uh, like LSD. Yeah. And I would yeah. say, um, and we started with LSD because no other no other group did it at the time. So yeah. um, it was just more interesting to go back to the LSD. There is a lot of data, but no modern data. So of course we wanted to test this. And at the time we perceived it safe. And nevertheless, it was much in terms of regulatory uh, hurdles. It was easier to start with MDMA and amphetamines. Mm-hmm. And then once the ethics committees were used to seeing such studies, we could move up to to uh, substances that were more perceived to be more dangerous, although this is not the case, but nevertheless, it was more tricky to have studies approved with LSD, even more tricky, I would say, than for psilocybin. Yeah. And uh, then, as you know, the last five or 10 years, many other groups also did LSD research. So, yeah. and, and now this is probably even widening more and more substances can be investigated. And then the, the step to therapeutic applications, once um, once the, the first studies were done in healthy subjects, the first mm-hmm. studies were done with psilocybin in patients, then of course you could also move to LSD in patients. Uh, yeah. uh, so that all became more, more, more easy. More, more easy. And let's say maybe now, <laughs> now you, it's hard, hard to understand. And it seems obvious for many younger people that these substances can be investigated, but that was by, by no means the case like 10 or 20 years ago. That's, that's, I actually wanted to ask you about that. What misconception or misunderstanding do you feel like has stayed? What do you think, is there anything in particular? I mean, we've obviously made large strides. LSD is, is starting to, you know, there's starting to be more research groups that are sort of tackling this. So there's obviously some destigmatization that's occurred uh, for LSD and psilocybin has a longer track record. Um, and if you think 40 years ago, uh, that was not the case with most of the substances that we are having a bit of leeway now to research. I'm curious if you feel there's anything in particular that continues to be a problematic misunderstanding that maybe you or your research group comes across quite often. Perhaps not. Perhaps many of these roadblocks have been lifted. No. So there are not so many roadblocks in terms of of the stigma of these substances. I mean, Mm -hmm. um, even if it were the case, we, we don't really care. I mean, there are let's say page, there are enough patients willing or wanting to participate in such studies. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not a treatment for everybody. If, if only five or 10% of the depressed patients or even less want, want this type of treatment and, or, or want to at least try it, that, that's by far enough. I mean, mm-hmm. not everybody wants to take uh, ketamine uh, or yeah. even antidepressants. Um, so that is not an issue, I would say. And, this, and, and once we have uh, positive uh, trial results or even an approval of a drug, then it, it becomes, uh, it, it is even less stigmatized. So I don't think this is a hurdle currently. Mm-hmm. Um, there still remains the, the simple fact that these controlled substances are more difficult to, to handle. So not only at the, at the sites where they're being used, but let's yeah. say if you intend to do a study with an established antidepressant, you can essentially simply get it from a company or, or even buy it in a pharmacy and then uh, use it as a study medication. Yeah. You have to make some adjustment, maybe blinding and things, but essentially you can get the treatment, the substance, and also the, the entire mm-hmm. uh, investigational medicinal product description from the essentially from the uh, the drug um, labeling. Yeah. And this is completely different for these substances. So on one hand, there may not, they may be investigational, so mm-hmm. there's simply nothing out. So it's like a new medication. So yeah. it's very difficult to develop a new medication. Already, this is main, probably the main hurdle. Yeah. That, that we are dealing with with substances that are not on the market. But the yeah. second hurdle would be that it's very tricky to ship such a medication across borders. If you, let's say, if it has been produced in the US and you want to use it in Germany, uh, you have to do certainly a lot of paperwork. Oof. And uh, I don't know how much the shipping will cost, or maybe you need uh, like a lot of safety measures just because it's uh, it's a scheduled substance. So yeah. this is one of the hurdles, the scheduling, not so much the stigma, so the simple fact that it is a controlled substance. You're essentially dealing with over-regulation or let's say just regulation of um, the human research, 
and yeah. the, the drug development process. So these are highly, highly regulated areas. And if you want to be a player in these areas, you, you need know-how. Yeah. So you need to know how to develop medications in order to maybe then test LSD or a simple substance in humans. Uh, you need a, typically an academic institution or pharma companies that support you um, and that <laughs> regulators will kind of accept your, your place of work. And in, then you need a lot of money. Uh, so these are the potential hurdles if you want to do true research in the sense of testing medications in patients yeah. uh, compared to just observing or whatever, have some guys recreationally use a substance and observing yeah. them what they do and then maybe have them even uh, produce their, their own placebos or whatever is being done. Is this a, in your opinion, a feasible workaround to this hurdle of legislation? Is like creating new drugs that perhaps have new legislations and rules around them or is that I guess my question more specifically would be, are you a supporter of this, um, I guess, of all these companies that are starting to pop up and these, these uh, startups that are looking to create new substances? Yes, or so yes, indeed, there are many, so, uh, there are many companies and yeah. I guess this could actually help to mm. um, push this, I, I, I would say this will help to push this area forward because yeah. there will be money and ideas and uh, new concepts and partnerships and so on. Um, I mean, psilocybin, MDMA, and LSD, or even mescaline even more, yeah. these are substances that have been uh, around for quite a while, some of them for thousands of years. And um, even scientifically for LSD and psilocybin, certainly, but also for MDMA, we do have a lot of data uh, already over, over sometimes decades of years. So yeah. um, if, you, if you come up with a new substance, it, it could be better, but at the moment you don't know that. And it may take a few years, depending on the substance, until you know whether there is an advantage or not. And it's not necessarily that an analog of psilocybin, for example, is not scheduled. So it can typically, yeah. you have to assume that any psychoactive substance that's similar to psilocybin in most countries will fall under the same uh, um, legislation in terms of controlling these substances. There may be small differences that you can use, let's say an LSD pro drug in Germany, mm -hmm. uh, although it's in the end producing same effects as LSD. But on the other hand, even if it's not controlled and you will legally be able to use this, it, it, it's not helping you in the drug development process because there, you would actually start with another molecule that's yeah. a new substance. And then in, in terms of medication, you would actually say, well, this could be even more dangerous than the existing LSD. Yeah. LSD is scheduled, uh, but we know it's, it's relatively safe. So how do we know that the non-scheduled uh, legal in, in, well, not really well or-, or yeah. I know what you mean. So it's, it's, I think this is the field where we all have to deal with, with the regulators, yeah. but then not, not saying that any analogs of the existing psychedelics will kind of just replace uh, the, the, the established substances. Yeah. Rather, both have, have will be there. And certainly the classic ones, I don't see a reason why the classic ones should not be investigated and used as first, probably even as front runners, because we already have a lot of safety and efficacy data. And then yeah. probably in a few years, maybe that some of the companies will replace the existing substances with their own patented molecules. I mean, that's, that's okay. Okay, that that uh, mm -hmm. that may be a business strategy for some. The company may even start by by using psilocybin, uh, like yeah. some do, and then later on maybe they get a, an analog and develop this in parallel or something like that. I would say this is being done. Yeah, there is no urgent need for for. I mean, all these, these things that we are seeing, uh, even psychedelics that are not psychedelic, but somehow nevertheless produce uh, neuroregenerative effects. So this mm -hmm. is in a separate area. Mm -hmm. uh, there is a lot. Of, there is a lot going on, and probably um, um, a lot will be. Uh, many of the ideas will be established in companies. I'm not saying that these ideas are already work or research, but yeah. <laughs> but I, I, I just want to put in there real quick that I completely agree. I think it's um, it really resonates me that it resonates with me that we needn't necessarily water down in the sense of the pool by adding a bunch of new molecules. We we the ones that we have in a sense. Um, how would you say that? Well, there's still a quite a lot of work that could be done with the Absolutely. molecules. No, I mean, all the current studies that I'm seeing uh, in phase two and three are, in fact, with the, yeah. with the substances that have been around a little bit longer. So essentially, psilocybin is the mostly investigated and MDMA and then maybe LSD. And uh, I don't see currently, at least certainly not in patient substances that are 
like novel psychedelics. So no. I expect this to be happening in, in very few years, of course. It, yeah. it, it definitely, there has been a push. I have seen hints of, you know, startups that are aiming to do that. In yeah, yeah, of course. Oh, man, I mean, the question is that there are tons of startups yeah. that, that have such plans and announce such intentions yeah. and may even have filed provisionary patents around this. But um, in the end, you want to see even as an investor in such companies, you want to see what are the molecules that are produced. That's easy already to produce yeah. a molecule, but then what are the substances that are tested in phase one and what's going into phase two? So that's yeah. uh, how I would assess uh, any development of new substances. And, and there is not much. I mean, just yeah. announcing that you have uh, set up a company and you are looking for short acting psilocybin. I mean, everybody can do that you don't That's need a great marketing it's a marketing pitch in some sense it does not have to be necessarily that you don't have anything i mean maybe mm -hmm. these companies indeed have a lot of things behind them but it's yeah. not necessarily the case with all of them yeah okay so because i feel like i'm taking up too much of your time already no that's not oh. at all <laughs> uh give me one when five years from now when we look back on let's say this conversation or just the state of the uh, psychedelics research or what do you think will change the most? I know that's a bit of a hard question as well, but if you think about how we here at Mind or just the psych psychedelics research at large, how will the field transition or adapt or change in the next five years? What Does anything stand out immediately that would be like yeah. a, big, no, a I, big change that's coming? No, I think the big change will be that we are really rapidly growing, meaning that any, any university will have some guys doing psychedelic research, any psychiatry will have, will need to have a few people um, uh, dealing with the option of using such uh, therapeutic um, approaches or doing research or actually participating simply in, in, a, in large phase three studies. So we should see in five years, we should have numerous yeah. phase three studies going on in different therapeutic areas. I expect at least 10 different molecules are being tested, including mm -hmm. novel ones. Um, in five years, it's even possible that first of these substances may be on the market. So maybe front runners being psilocybin or LSD or MDMA at the, MDMA, at the yeah. moment, but within fact, yeah. So um, I ex even if, if not a single substance is on the market for an indication, I would say by 10 years, we will have numerous substances and indications that are being covered. And this will, will um, we have to deal with this over the next 10 or 20 years. So I, I also, I'm not afraid that this is kind of just small wave that's going away or something. I mean, if we have a single study that's not positive, there will be numerous other ones that will mm -hmm. be. Um, you can make errors with a design. It's not meaning that the substance is not good. We do know that the substances are likely effective from yeah. many, many uh, observatory studies and first placebo controlled studies. So mm -hmm. the guess will be a lot of work is being done, but obviously whether this is the future treatment, um, it's one of the treatment options, I'm almost sure, yeah. Mm -hmm. Cool. Thank you. Um, Thank you as well. Last, last, no, really, last, uh, last uh, question. Um, I don't know if you've looked into at all uh, the roster for this year's Insight Conference. No. By any chance? No. No worries. That's that's totally fine. <laughs> I would have asked if there was anything in particular that that you were interested in, or any of the other talks that perhaps you would come across, or any of these. No, I, I have seen that there. I mean, almost everybody working in the field from many many different countries will be present so this is really exciting i mean in the end it's not just uh, the talks it's the exchange between all these these people what are they currently doing what are their yeah what are what are the projects that they are envisioning uh, for the next year so this is highly attractive to have so many people experts and uh, newcomers in the field present in one place so that's really that's really a congratulation on on making this happen Thank you. We, we really appreciate that. We're we're working hard here to make this happen. And um, I think good. you can expect, I mean, we are certainly going to have an on-site conference. And um, I was just asked this yesterday, as far as I know, uh, we plan to have all, if not most, if not every speaker we can there on site. So um, as of right now, there aren't many speakers that I know of that are going to be virtual. That's not to say there aren't one or two somewhere, but we're really pushing to make sure this is an on-site thing. Um, and, Great. Uh, Okay, cool. thank you very much. Well, really, thank you. It, it was a pleasure. I really appreciate you taking the time to. Okay, to so see you then. Thank you so much. Bye.